I always think I can always get better. Um, you know, probably similar to yourself, mm. I, I approach broadcasting and punditry and commentating as I'm on this journey and I'm always going to get better. Mm. Um, so when it comes to being successful in life, I always kind of say to people, just throw yourself into it. Welcome back to the Art of Success. It's Ebs here and so excited to bring you episode 004. Now I'm about to shout out one of my friends, Hirsch, who keeps me giving me grief about saying 00. Mate, listen, there's a point why I'm saying this. I'm trying to remind myself I have to get to 100. So by putting those two zeros in, that's the reason. So leave me alone, mate. Just thought I'd shout you out to hopefully embarrass you. Anyway, uh, this week on the podcast, we have an amazing trailblazer, someone I'm honoured to call a friend, Maggie Alvarez. Alfonsi MBE. If you haven't heard about her, it's hard not to. She's just out there making things happen in the world. She's a former rugby international. For England, she won the World Cup. She's a World Cup winner. Amazing. Uh, She also was part of the team that won the Sports Personality of the Year. Herself, she was a Sunday Times Sportswoman of the Year. She's now an established commentator. She was the first female to commentate on men's rugby. Recently, she was involved in the ITV Men's World Rugby Cup lineup. Um, she's a regular on Sky, BBC, BT Sport, and she's also a speaker. This woman is so inspiring and pleased that she's the first female on the podcast. She's just amazing to know. So the first few minutes of this podcast are going to be like a catch up in a pub, really. We both just kind of talk over each other for a little while. But then we settle down to talk about Maggie and how she approaches life. She's just taking so many things away. One thing that I thought that really stood out for me was just how she talked about how people backed her and that helped her develop her belief to go forward. And I think what often happens is we see people, you know, going on doing something, achieving a goal, and you just see that person as the success, but you forget about the kind of people around them who helped them make that sort of journey. I think about myself and someone who was really important to me, which most probably no one will ever hear the name of in terms of, um, you know, your journey when you're talking is a lady called Jenny Wastrak. She passed a couple of years ago, but she was the one reason I would say I've gone on to be able to achieve my dream of playing cricket at the high level. Um, You know, she realised from a young age, she was one of the first people who spotted me as a talent about 12 years old. She got me into the club set up in the county. She realises there were challenges at home. And so what she used to do was support us by getting uh, sponsorships and scholarships to help pay for equipment. She used to drive me up and down the country. I mean, to any Uh, game to any sort of trials and things like that she really put in for about six or seven years of my life she even helped me you know learn things like how to oil your first cricket bat or knock it in and you know you people don't hear about that part of the journey enough I think we always hear about you know how someone's done x y on z and Maggie really talks about her mum and also teachers who supported her and that was really nice to hear So there's loads to take away from this. Uh, She's helped me shape so many more chapters in the book. She's just brilliant to know. Uh, So tune in. I hope you enjoy it this week. And also, um, don't forget, if you're liking this, please do share it. Um, Subscribe if it's on YouTube or give it a like on SoundCloud. Um, It's just been great to hear so many people loving it. So thanks for your time. Um, I've also got a Facebook page and now I'm setting up a group, which just means that people who are, you know, excited and passionate about achieving their goals I'll share content and just get in touch with you all and we can all have a chat I love a chat um so enjoy as well and please do share and listen to Maggie's insight what a woman okay we're in the game and we have just well I've had my first podcast fail right I've I've come with all this stash Maggie I wanted to impress you and now we're in the back of some hotel bar <laughs> looking a bit dodgy but thank you for taking your time no worries first of all um as you know i'm doing some research and interviewing very successful people you've nailed it before i start yeah. i i've got a rundown of your cv okay and yeah. this is important because to remind you sometimes of what you've done mm. and like achieved so that when we reflect today it's kind of what you're about so i've got you were born interestingly 20th yeah. of december 1983 couple of days apart from each other in South East London. Oh my god, you're like my long lost sister. That's the funniest thing. Because I didn't know that you were 
close to my birthday. Yeah. Um, and you said also you're South London based. Yes. Yeah. South East, you were born, South. were you? I was born in Lewisham. So Lewisham. I don't really, South, Lewisham I'm South like East. You're South. South, South, South East. It's a South, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, yeah. So it's, we are so, it's so weird. It's honestly the most un. You could have made it up. No. The fact that your birthday is close to mine. Do you get, wait, do you, can I ask a question? Do you get two presents for Christmas time or do you get the one? I usually only get the one and it's usually like, uh, my birthday, I tell you what, my mm. birthday's either like party, everyone's up for it or everyone's lost it by Christmas yeah. and I'm out. So I don't know, you're just before Christmas. Well, my, well mine tends to be when people have work parties on. So if I, obviously when I worked for uh, other companies, we'd always have a work party, Christmas work party on that day. So you kind of like double up. And celebrations. When I was a kid, we used to always have Christmas parties as well um, at school, so it always, again, fitted in quite well. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, you're right. I, people have pretty much gone on their on their Christmas holidays if, if I haven't caught them at the right time. So if I have to have a birthday party, yeah. it has to be either well before the 20th, like on a Saturday at yeah. some point before then. Or well after. So it's not that glamorous. Awful. No, no, no. We're, we've missed out on like, but two yeah. women born in South London who've gone on to win World Cups in women's sport. That's pretty cool, right? Hey, hey look, and they're in this little room in Wembley. I mean, what are the chances <laughs> of that? We've gone together? far, right? <laughs> so, this, okay, so yeah. I'm going to run down on your history before I talk to you about specific course, things. So, so obviously you were a flank of Saracens, yeah. England. You've won. A, you played in two World Cups. Oh, I played in. In total, I played in four. Four World yeah, Cups. Yeah, yeah. So I played in like three fifteens rugby World Cups and uh, one sevens yeah, yeah, World yeah. Cups as a flanker. Um, so in, uh, yeah, sorry. In the fifteens, yes, as a flanker. In sevens, very much. You don't. I'm a forward. You don't really call. You don't really give you a position yeah, as much. You can tell uh, I'm a cricketer. <laughs> sorry, I'm, oh, you can teach me all about cricket. Yeah, that, yeah. That'll help me. Um, but yeah, so basically four World Cups in total, but one of them was the biggest success okay okay and that's the one that everyone remembers but there's obviously a journey before that um obviously since retiring i mean obviously you've gone on to uh, had a great career in broadcasting which is ridiculously exciting and you i'm like i'm like oh my god it's ebony (laughs) do you remember that once to watch um we did a photo shoot that's when we first ever met which was had jessica ennis hill me, you, a lady called Jeeva Mentor who's gone yeah. to play rugby, and any a loke, any a loku, yeah, yeah, yeah who's and gone to football. There was another the um, netball player. I forgot. Is it Jeeva Mentor? Is that, is that her? Yeah, is that she her was very thing? tall. That's tall. Yeah. Netball. So all I remember the photographer going, "Tall lady, can you move? Over? Tall lady, can you move to the right? Tall yeah. lady, can you... <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, she's got a name. Um, so yeah, that was that was like must have been way before, like twelve, thirteen years ago, before Jessica Ennis actually made it big, um, and again. And she was just another athlete yeah, and now yeah. it's quite fun to look at us and where we all gone on to try and achieve really um, yeah just getting just done alright yeah, yeah, but I mean you know just, uh, I mean, just a household <laughs> name I mean? now, like, but, it's fun. but we like what's great is that how we've all kind of gone our, our separate ways and actually we were one to, ones to watch back then so that's quite um, yeah. I've got to find it somewhere I've got to rectify oh, yeah, it yeah I've got to dig it, it out yeah, I think, I've yeah. still got it I keep all my clippings so it's got to be somewhere and I'm going to prove to other people who I've told that yeah. that story actually is true. Oh, um, I'm going to dig it out. I'll, I'll, I think someone's got it. My mum's most probably got it. Um, so, right on top of all this yeah. as well, you 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 got uh, you did your studies as well. So yeah. you've got sport and exercise science. Yeah. Um, you were part of the sports personality team of the year, which we went up for it when we won, but didn't get it. You actually, yeah. actually won. So tell me about yours because I didn't know that. So yeah, so we that? the year we won the World Cup, which is 2009, 2009 yeah. we got nominated and we won the World Cup World T20 Ashes oh my God, but didn't yeah. actually make it but you guys who's you, you up against that's uh, what the I'm men's sure. team won it in the end yeah. for winning the men's Ashes it's right times yeah. are, it's a sign it's, that times yeah, had moved that's on that's what I think because we became the first female team to win an, a, the, the, the team award because I did some research and I was like the, the, the last team to actually win it wasn't actually a team it was a team it was the it was women's and men's rowing mm-hmm. so it, was, it wasn't considered to be a women's only team um, but what's great is like you said it's some of the times because actually last year it could have quite easily been um, I think it was football was up mm-hmm. for a nomination so, and again this year you know there's going to be a women's team so yeah, yeah. women's teams are I think it's sport been is on the it was hockey that's it hockey was up for yeah, yeah. nomination but missed out um, I think it's Leicester City won it yeah I, I guarantee you next year there'll be something else because there's, there's Women's Cricket World Cup, you've got the Hockey World Cup, and you've got Women's Rugby World Cup. So anything that can happen over this time, which could mean, again, another team goes on to win it. Right, your time's precious. Yeah, so yeah, we're going to get into... Like so, okay, um, <clears throat> I want you to think back. So basically, yeah. as you know, I'm doing some research. I want you to think back to early days, mm-hmm. right? And think about your whole journey, all the things you've achieved. Yeah. If you could put 
your finger on the one thing that's led to your personal success. Yes. Just yours, and it could be anything that springs to mind. Mm -hmm. What do you think the one thing that's been responsible for your success is? Um, I think it would would be... Oh, there's so many different factors which contribute, and I, and I, I just, I, what I do, I'll throw out all the factors, and yeah, then I'll, I'll work finalise it, out. it. So, one, I think my upbringing. Um, everyone talks about upbringing. So, I think um, I grew up council estate. That was quite a challenging environment. Didn't I wasn't born with money one bit. My mum, single parent, worked incredibly hard, did several jobs to ensure that, you know, I didn't see the difference between mm -hmm. living in the environment that I did compared to my friends who lived in three bedroom, four bedroom houses. So I didn't, you know, that was quite, that had a, a, had a bearing on my success, I think. So the, my upbringing. I also think I had people who believed in me that made mm. a big difference so at secondary school I had I can give a range of teachers um who made a difference to my um I guess attitude in school and uh, because they they backed me they believed in me um so it meant that I wanted to work hard for them not just for me and when I let them down I felt that as opposed to being told off to make a difference but letting someone down really had an impact so people who supported me and I would say the third thing that another factor which is contributed to me being successful I would say um, I, I've always had a bit of a drive to always want to be the first mm -hmm. and I think the fact that there's not been for example let's say in women's bro in broadcasting there's not a lot of You're women the out there first female or to commentate on men's in the rugby, yeah. rugby. Uh, and what's great is like, can I talk to you you're, you're, you're like nailing it in cricket um uh, Aisha is also yeah, doing yeah, cricket. Yeah. Um, I, I can go Anson on in other Mitchell, sports. Yeah, yeah. There's so many, and this is what I love now. Like I want to be part of that. I want. I want to be part of that journey. So, I think for me, it's always been wanting to be the first. Um, it has sort of been a bit of an inner drive. Mm. I didn't want to have role models when I was young. I had a role model, um, but I didn't want to have role models because I don't want to be like them. I want to exceed them, and I want people to kind of sort of come along with me mm. on that journey. Mm. Mm. So if I was to nail it down to one factor, I think it probably what made me successful is having people believe in me. Yeah. That's what, and, that, and that I can throw in on the okay. mum, my teacher. And so all I'm going to throw a question to you. Yeah. The chicken and egg. What came first? <clears throat> do you think your mum saw you as a young kid who had something yes. and invested? Or do you think your mum was, I'm going to instill these values? Yeah. And it, or do you think it's, yeah. I think it's funny. Like my mother, very uh, strict Nigerian, mm. um, you know, wanted me to be a doctor, a nurse, all of that stuff. Um, I, I think she was very much based on just work hard and you'll get your success. Mm. That's the key thing. When I told her I wanted to do rugby, she did not accept that or acknowledge it. Uh, but she's always been a sports fan. So I think what she wanted me to do is, do you know, what? if you want to do sport, that's fine. But just really think about where you're going with it. Mm. Um, I also did music as well. And she's like, again, if you like to do that, where is it going to lead you? What's the career you want to mm. Um, have at the end so I, I owe a lot of my um, being groundedness to my mum so I, I think she was brilliant for that I do think though the P teachers who I met in my life and the other people who have you know you meet many people on your journey P teacher started off and many others have kicked it on but um, I think one P teacher particularly called Lisa Burgess was, was quite significant to me picking up rugby and then there's other teachers like Miss Walker um, Graham Webber, Louise Canty, these are the, the, the main teachers at my second school. Mm. Um, and I went to a really rough school who really backed me. Mm. And I owe a lot to them to this day. And that's allowed me to keep. So when I do work now and I think, oh, things are maybe challenging, because we all have ups and downs. Yeah, yeah. Think about them, because they're the ones who are kind of like, well, look, I'm going to give you some money to help you go to try and go. I went to represent Great Britain in touch rugby. My teachers paid for that. Mm -hmm. um, they got me off the naughty step I guess because I was a really bad kid mm -hmm. and gave me direction so I owe a lot to them they were like mentors to me that's really powerful that's yeah. really... okay talk to me about so I did not know I've known you yep. seen you over the years but I did not know you had club foot I know and yeah. like talk to me about like one what that was like two how you overcame it yeah Three, yeah, just talk, yes. just talk, because so that's fascinating. For those who don't know what it is, club foot is basically where one or both of your feet are turned all the way in. Uh, and for me growing up, I was born with my right foot turned all the way in. And the funny thing is, I probably didn't know a lot about I didn't know anything about it until I got older, because, mm. again, it's a childhood thing, so I never really recognised it. But what happens is, well, um, the doctors said to my mother, you know, she can have an operation to get it straightened, and so she went ahead with it. It's quite a, a difficult 
thing for any parent to say yeah, yes yeah, to yeah. because the child's going to go under how old very young actually because I think it has to be five, done three, under, the, under, under five yeah, that young so age. your bones are so soft and you can actually so do they can some adjust yeah. It, yeah. so from a young age that's quite a challenge um, <clears throat> and there's another there's other methods where people wear boots I think which can straighten, straighten over out. time but I'm from what I do remember is being a child and like going through an experience of like that and you know you have to go to hospital a few times to make sure it's corrected having an operation having something in your foot um but i don't know it vividly that that time but what's funny is as i've got older you know and, I, and people talk to me about the condition i i actually just got on with it really mm. as a rug player um and if anything you know it, it became it didn't become a, it wasn't a disability i be, you know i just saw it as to some part, a, part of my, of one of the yeah, things you work with. I've got to train it. And Did your mum try and make you protect it? Or no, no. She just well, kind of let you crack well, on. Well, well, she was, <laughs> she's like, you know, when it comes to um, hard work and graft, yeah. she's like, just get on with it. If the more you think about it, the more you dwell on it, the 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 further back you you mm. will be. Mm. So I just got on with it really. Um, but when I was in my England team, the focus was all around. So my strength conditioning trainers would make sure that I work on my calf and mm-hmm. the strength around that area. Um, just making sure that I had better a better running gait mm-hmm. um, but I also developed lots of hamstring problems and wow. knee problems. So it actually had lots of impact but I never really I, I didn't use it as an excuse I just got on with it so my teammates probably didn't know I had it they mm. just thought I'd run a little bit different, different. to them yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah I had it when I was young um, but I, it's, it's amazing I talk about it now lots of people lots of top athletes have mm. had it Stephen Gerrard had, no had club foot um, there's a couple of other like, top sprinters as well have had it yeah. and it's just been something they've just developed and figured it out and had operations on it usually or had it corrected but lots of top athletes have had club foot it's yeah. not it's not a uncommon condition because there's different severities of it mm-hmm. but yeah it's a, I, it's something that started my journey and it's funny how um, I've gone on to be uh, yes. successful in sport yeah, and athlete, athlete. Yeah, yeah you know because um, there's a lot of Paralympic athletes that actually have yeah, this yeah. so it's not really that uncommon in yeah. a way okay so talk to me about attitude so yes. attitude I think is something that massively separates those who go on and achieve great success and those who don't and mindset and in in already what you're saying a few things have come in about hard work and your mum's instilled values mm. um, cracking on despite setbacks yeah. so do you, do you, th- you know, in terms of developing attitude, let's put it another way, yes. because you've talked about doing a bit of mentoring and yeah. things like that. Like, what do you talk about when it comes to attitude? Yeah, um, I, you know, I talk a lot about mindset. So we talk a lot around the growth mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, so Carol Dweck just yeah, did a lot of work on, around. Yeah. yeah, so there's fixed mindset where you, know, where you believe that what it is is what I've got and I can't get any better. And there's that growth mindset where you go, actually, I, with a bit of training, a bit of... Um, development I can get better and that's, what, well, that's how I, I, I approach life now I always think I can always get better um, you know probably saying to yourself mm. I, I approach broadcasting and punditry and commentating as I'm on this journey and I'm always going to get better mm. um, so when it comes to being successful in life I always kind of say to people just throw yourself into it you will have setbacks. You've almost got to embrace the setbacks, mm. embrace those challenges and then make sure you reflect on it constructively use people around you um, to help you support that journey and then just think that you will get better that's what I love that's mm. how I approach everything now in life I kind of say I will get better at it yeah. it doesn't matter where I am right now I will get better but I have to be um, quite smart about that process okay but devil's advocate a little yeah. bit so I think it's easy for us guys who may be extreme kind yeah. of obsessive want to get better but you need a certain amount of resilience mm. to be able to handle yeah. the failures right yeah, yeah. And, it's yeah. Because like you, you know, like before you, you know, before you won in two thousand and nine, mm. you would have gone through a lot of failures. Yeah. Um, and I and I'm a big believer, and I assume you will as well. Failures are the key to successes. Mm. So when I talk about successes, I always say, you know, losing is is the is the prime factor behind becoming successful. Let me give you an example. Mm. So uh, the England men's rugby team, mm-hmm. um, they in two thousand fifteen they in the Rugby World Cup, um, they didn't make it through the pool stages. They hosted the World Cup. The whole country was on their shoulders. They didn't do, they didn't, um, do well, and it was a challenging time for them. They come back. They go, well, it's a few changes, but the attitude and the change of mm. uh, growth mindset and how they perceive things now. What's amazing is they go on to win two Six Nations, the first Six Nations tournament they won, Grand Slam straight away. Then they win the next Six Nations. And then a lot of these players now 
they've just got this mindset where they go they don't believe they can lose mm. and I said that all come from that failure because once you've experienced that failure you do not want to go back so then you start to think how can I go forward how can mm. I go forward instead of thinking what, what haven't I done what haven't I done it's like actually how do I go forward and progress so failure is key yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. so interesting some of the things you said there is you talked about the thinking process you, you mentioned in terms of you know when things are going wrong if you start to think mm. self talk right oh, yeah is so important like can you think to in your career or even now mm. like positive yeah experiences but also negative like when it's yeah, not in yeah. the right places and how, sort of things you've said to yourself to yeah so um throughout my career when i was an athlete i used to use um, affirmations all mm. the time so i'd start off my day with a bit of a uh, a phrase uh, I think it was I was fit I'm fit I'm fast I'm athletically, athletically strong wow. I'd say it to myself every morning so it will remind myself that I'm fit I'm fast I'm athletically strong so if I kept telling myself that you be, you, you become the words that you say so that's Love what it. I used to use when I was an athlete and now I'm not in, in as an athlete I'm obviously living a normal life like everyone else but there's times for example when I'm commentating on punditry you know you use affirmations to just remind yourself you know you are you, you know you're you're, you're good at this, mm. you know what you're talking about, go for it. Um, I, haven't, I don't necessarily use affirmations over that period, but I do use self-talk mm. to sort of just, or I write things down to sort of remind myself. Yeah, yeah. People who love quotes, you know, that's, that's a big thing, but I don't necessarily use quotes anymore. I was when I was an athlete. But really, I just kind of use strong words like, I mean, on my neck, I've got a necklace, and at the moment on my necklace it says strong, bold, and brave. Mm -hmm. it just keeps me sort of thinking, yeah, that's what I'm, yeah. It requires courage. You've got courage. You've got bravery, and you are strong in your mind. So those are the sort of things I I use, and I think lots of athletes use mm. it. But like you said, there's times when it's not so so right, where you can almost talk yourself to, out of doing or being successful. Mm. Um, look, you know, sports like tennis, where you're so exposed, and you're just like things like that. When you're in when you're in that difficult situation where you have to execute. And you just don't back yourself. Mm. That's when you you know you've lost it. Um, Will Green, red rugby player, he talked a lot, and he he brought a book out, and he talked a lot in his book, saying he would almost lose the fight before he'd, he'd lose the rugby match before he'd actually wow. started playing it because there's times when he'd be talking he'd talk himself out on the coach mm -hmm. he'd be on before the, he's even yeah, got there he's on the coach and he'd almost be going oh god I hope this coach crashes maybe or <laughs> just to sort of so he doesn't yeah, have to play yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's amazing and he was really interesting uh, um, he's still successful though but he would talk, you know, talk about how self-talk can have that real negative attitude mm -hmm. and it can affect you before you've even got on the, on the field of play Okay, so motivating yourself, and I'm, I'm linking self-talk yeah. to motivation because yeah. you talked about waking up and having this. Like, it's easy on days when your body's feeling good, there's no injury, yeah. you're winning. Um, but what about when you when it wasn't going so well? How do you yeah. how and how still do you motivate? I'm sure there's days you wake up and yeah. it's early, yeah. and you know how do you motivate yourself? So uh, the way I used to motivate myself. Um, I, so as an athlete, what I used to do is I'd have my positive affirmations, mm -hmm. talk, talk to myself on a regular basis. I would I have my goals. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone has to have a go, goal. But I always say to people, it's not about your goal, it's about the why behind the goal. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I mean like, you know, really, I want to win a World Cup. Yeah, that's great. I think everyone had that same goal. But why do you want to win a World mm -hmm. Cup? And actually for me, it's about making my mum proud. So that kind of like stuck wow, in my head yeah, a little yeah, bit, yeah, you know. Yeah. Going to university was about making my mum proud. So that's kind of like, my, that was my driver. So... I would always think about my goal and the why behind my goal to sort of keep me going. Um, set, you know, we all talk about goal settings. Mm -hmm. I set in lots of little, I, I call them quick wins, mm -hmm. to make you go, yeah, I've got it, boom, brilliant, next one, give me another one. And, and you just sort of use that to just spur you on that little bit more. Um, I would always make sure I've rewarded myself. Mm -hmm. That's um, good, that's interesting. You know, take time out. Is that, are we talking chocolate? Or are we talking... Oh, I, don't, I don't eat chocolate. Just a bit of extra my, sleep. My... Um, my weakness is, is biscuits uh, and, and bread. What so, type of biscuits? Uh, well, I've, I've gone through a phase. I go, I, do you know what? No, I've never been a big fan of that. <laughs> custard cream. Then I moved oh. on to a bit of a ginger nut. Oh, yeah. And a bit of a garibaldi. And now I've kind of gone back to rich tea. So it's oh, yeah. like, because I've gone, oh, I need to really reduce the amount. So yeah, why don't yeah. I just change the flavour? Yeah. <laughs> custard creams are a bit extreme. <laughs> oh, like. my God. that's, that's yeah, But yeah. they're good. They're good. I mean, you know, Peter Kay, you've got to see Peter Kay's. Have you seen this? No, no, no. <gasps> if you haven't seen it, you've got to see. He's I've got, got a really good skit about... Um, Biscuits oh, and, it? and how gin, the ginger nut biscuits, uh, they're like, dunk me again, dunk me again, dunk me again. And before, <laughs> begging. before you know it, they've taken on your whole tea. So, uh, yeah, you've got, to, you've got to make sure you see that. But, um, yeah, sorry, right. No, 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 we're good. Off, off the, off the, 
the chat there. But um, so I used to always make sure I reward myself, and that mm. could be. Um, you know, go out and do something with, with friends who aren't associated with rugby. Mm. Um, just, I'd always take time out. And I didn't know that towards That's the end of my rugby career. Because actually, when I was really in the thick of it, like you and your cricket, mm. all of my friends, everyone around me was rugby. And actually, it, sh- it almost probably too much pressure, stressed me out. And then I realised towards the end of my career, to really make sure I enjoy my rugby, mm. I need to like take myself away from the rugby at times. Yeah, yeah, just to yeah. switch off. It's like when people work Monday to Friday. You do Monday to Friday work... Saturday, Sunday, don't talk about work. Yeah, and that's yeah, what, yeah. My attitude now I'll do when I do some corporate talks or do anything which involves trying to help motivate people, I always say, when you don't need to talk about it, mm. don't talk about it. So mm. I always find it bizarre in my work environment. We'd go out for a work meal with lots, lots of people and we'd talk about work. Yeah, yeah and you think, that. chill out, like, it's time to yeah, talk about... switch off. It's interesting, I did Ellie Simmons a couple of days yeah. ago and she, who's someone you think, she's been in it since she's 12, yeah. she's done it 10 years, won everything. And she was like, the need for balance is so important, that having other things, friends, other... And I was quite surprised because I thought she would be so, like... Yeah. obsessed in yeah. it because the amount she's done but and she talks about is that different as well yeah, yeah. I mean they, they train they, uh, morning afternoon noon, night. night yeah, yeah. Um, but balance is key I think you don't again you don't know that until you come you, you mature a little bit and yeah. you realise this is too much for me I'm burnt out yeah, yeah. and when you hit and burnt out it comes about too late <laughs> until you know you've you've, 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 you've done it like yeah this. so yeah. Uh, yeah I would always say reward yourself and make sure you have time out um, and what other things I used to reward myself not reward myself and uh, motivate myself um, I would celebrate successes I guess it's pretty the same really mm. so when you do well like if I for example I don't know got my starting shirt against New Zealand and once I get that you know make sure I celebrate that and mm. I'm aware I recognise that instead of looking back and going oh I didn't do this didn't do that really think about all the things that you you have done really well brilliant I've got my first shirt for against New Zealand um, I bench pressed 115 you know think about all celebrate the good things that you've done yeah okay so I'm going to do two more questions because I know you've got to run yeah. um, the two questions I have is pressure so yeah and you would have experienced this individually and maybe sometimes, um, you know, that increases depending on what's going on. You'd have experienced it as a team when you guys are going into World Cup and each round you get. Yeah. How did you handle pressure expectations? Yeah. So I, um, I used to love it. Really? And, and one of the things which and some of my sports psychologist said, but I know she, she nicked that from another person's quote, <laughs> um, is pressure is a privilege. Mm. And they talk about it all the time and not until it really sunk in and I was like, oh my God, you're right. I've, the fact that I've got pressure is because people have expectations on me mm. and that's amazing and I love the fact that people are talking about me and expect me to do well for this team so I got to the point where I was like I absolutely love the big stage mm. I, I love knowing that there's whatever thousands of people out there um, coming to watch a women's game which is which is quite always quite a rare thing and that they expect me to do a good do a good job for the team Love that. So I never saw it as a as a concern. It never broke me. I never was nervous. Mm. It, when I played rugby, I was like, I've got this. I've been doing it for so long. I've got this in in the bag. Um, that doesn't mean there's times when I you know didn't perform. Mm. But I have to admit, I looked at as I looked pressure to be a privilege, and now I'm trying to adapt that in my work that I do now. Mm. Either in a corporate environment or in, you know, obviously media like yourself, it's trying to see pressure as a privilege. It's, mm. wow, you're there. Mm. Oh, my God, enjoy the experience. Enjoy the big matches. Enjoy the feeling of, you know, talking about a, a sport that you absolutely love. So, um, yeah, it's almost... I try to turn it around. Instead of looking at it and being nervous about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And seeing, actually, wow, this is... People expect you to do well because they think you're good. Go with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Okay, last yeah. question I'm yeah. going to finish on. Um, I feel like we could talk about this for totally hours, honestly. but we, we've both got places to go. I've got <laughs> Get to leave, you've got to oh, get back. Cool, yeah. um, last question is about, and you, the reason why I mention it is because straight away we talked before we turned on the podcast mm-hmm. about Seven Habits of uh, yeah. Stephen Covey. He talks about Carol Dweck mindset, growth yeah. mindset, and other book. You, you seem to be someone who enjoys the learning massively. Yeah. So um, I don't know about you, but when I was an athlete, I used to I love reading. Mm. I didn't read autobiographies much. I think that's probably one thing I try to steer away from. I loved reading about psychology mm. and understanding what makes people tick. Um, understanding how to, you know, better yourself. I love to grow, grow myself individually and mm. invest in me. That's what my attitude has always been. Uh, and even now, like, I'm very much, I love 
um, helping others realise their potential. And the best way to do that, I think, is reading. That's you know, mm. God, the fact that you can take in all this information and you can become more self-aware is such a special thing. Um, so yeah, I, I love my psychology. I, mentoring and coaching is the two things that I'm really big on right now. Um, but I love the fact that there's so much. Uh, transition or mm. similarities from sport into business and in, into life you know the things that you've done in sport i.e. maybe prioritising and planning is the same in a business project management world is the same in what mm. you're doing today going up you know having to plan and prep and I love that sort of um, it's like transferable skills but also just understanding psychology and how the how the mind works what you know what your behaviours can have an impact on others, all that stuff. So I can waffle on about Yeah, yeah, no, I think we could talk. Okay, final question. Yes. We're going to wrap up on this. There's a Maggie that's five years old now, yeah. right? Little Maggie coming up and you're still around, you're grown Maggie. Yeah. Um, if you were to give her one message or one bit of advice yeah. that you think would lead to her success, what would yeah. you say to her? Um, I would probably say to her... Don't be concerned by what others around her think of her. Mm. That's the hardest thing, I think. Even as an athlete, it sounds so silly because people think that we're so confident, and we are, but we are constantly consumed by what other people think about us. And thankfully, growing up, social media wasn't that big. Mm. So I, I feel quite pleased and happy with, the, with my life growing up because I think only social media has really only become really big now. Um, but I do think it's very easy to fall into this trap of thinking about how people think about me outside of the outside of sports. So wearing my normal clothes, what people think about you. But also when you're on the field, everyone wants to throw their two pence in, and that's a challenge I think mm. for athletes to really get away from because we are all addicted in a way to our phones. So I would say to the younger Maggie, don't be obsessed or worried about what people think about you. Um, it's easier said than done, but really be confident in you and your ability, and that's who you should really answer to, not to mm. everyone else. And that's a challenging thing. And I think, like I said, not just athletes. I think young people, adults, are constantly aware of that. Like when I work with people in the corporate world, they are constantly thinking about what others think about them. And actually, really, you should be thinking about you and your capabilities and what you can bring to the company or what you can do for yourself to progress. Mate, that's perfect. Like, absolutely Absolute perfect. pleasure. As always, we'll have to catch up for a proper yeah, hangout soon. Definitely. Um, but two whizzy people. But thank you for your time, mate, as no always. Problem. You're a legend. And there you have it. Maggie Alfonsi, MBE. Just so cool of her to take some time out. She's someone I've absolutely loved getting to know over the last sort of maybe eight years or so just through our sporting journeys and it's just nice to have people in your life who they inspire you every time you see them they're pushing and striving and they also you know give you that support and always there with that kind of uh, energy and excitement for life it's just lovely you know an example of her attitude is you know I turned up and mentioned at the start of the podcast there was a podcast fail and what I meant by that is I turned up with all this stash, you know, the microphones, all the mixers, all this sort of stuff, and just nothing was working, the batteries died. Um, and also with the room where we meant to do it in, it just wasn't working and we had to go around the back of some hotel bar. It was all a bit, you know, just messy. And she was just like, mate, let's just get on with it. Like, get the phone out, let's just try something different. She had this can-do attitude, and that's what I love about her. So I've got a lot of takeaways from it, loads um, to take away. One thing that I, I've heard her say, Ellie Simmons is going to say it in a podcast we're going to do soon, is about learning to switch off and balance. You know, sometimes we're so driven or trying to make things happen, whether it's getting ahead at work or, you know, getting that fitness goal or whatever it is, that we forget to factor in balance. And it's nice hearing her say that. It, it really kind of gave me a bit of perspective there. The other thing that I loved about her, something I'd most probably love to uh, steal a little bit of is just how she talks about loving pressure now I I enjoy it sometimes sometimes I don't and it overwhelms me and I get anxiety but she kind of really embraced it and when she talks about that quote I think it's a Billie Jean King quote about pressure being a privilege um, Serena Williams talks about that quote as well pressure being a privilege it's just great to hear how she absorbs it and I think that's something I'd love to add to a bit of my life and I think that the biggest thing is you know people who are driven they want to achieve goals but she talks about having the why behind the goal that's the thing that motivates you especially on the tough days her mum was the reason that drove her in that world of sport wanting to make her proud and I think if we can remember and distill what our why is that's just going to help us 
crack on achieve our own version of success took so much away from maggie like i say i hope you enjoyed it this week if you want to get in touch feel free on social media facebook i'm on everything twitter twitter's at ej rainford brent um, and also feel free to uh, you know drop me an email or anything with ideas I've already actually had quite a few people suggest some great people that are now lined up in worlds I'd never have imagined before so thanks for your engagement and just have a great week hope you keep pursuing those goals Thank you.